Hello, and thanks for joining us and viewing our presentation titled Global Perspectives of Work and Careers, Internationalizing Fourth Semester Spanish. I am Mandy Menke, and I am the Director of Language Programs and an Assistant Professor of Spanish at the University of Minnesota, and I'm here presenting today with my colleague. I'm Sarah Mack. I am the uh, Senior Lecturer and Coordinator of Spanish 1004 at the University of Minnesota. All right. So second or foreign language classes are often assumed to be inherently international and have the potential to contribute significantly to institutional goals of producing globally competent citizens. We're going to explore this idea in the talk, starting with what has been said in the field regarding foreign languages and internationalization, and then moving into the internationalizing teaching and learning framework used at the University of Minnesota how we are revising our curriculum to give a more central position to international perspectives. We don't claim to have all of the answers in this talk, but rather we hope to share our journey, ideas, and questions with you. So in this first part of the talk, the introduction, we've got two main segments. The first one is about the motivations and definitions of internationalizing the university. And the second is internationalizing second and foreign language teaching and learning context and contradictions. So what does it mean to internationalize the university? Altbach and Knight in 2007 and DeWitt in 2001 identified four motivations for internationalizing institutions of higher education. Among these are academic motivations, such as enhancing research and knowledge capacity, social or cultural motivations, such as increasing cultural understanding, political motivations, including enhancing the competitiveness, prestige, and strategic alliances of the colleges or universities, and economic motivation, such as financial gain. The 2004 definition of internationalization offered by Knight, and that you can see here in this slide, connects internationalization with the core of a university's mission by identifying it as part of a university's purpose and function. It also puts forward that it should inform the way education happens. The approach adopted by the University of Minnesota reflects this educational vision in that it envisions transforming the instruction that happens in classrooms so that all students have an opportunity to consider their discipline of study through international, global, and intercultural lenses. Sayaya and Hayward in 2003 identified a few common initiatives institutions undertake in order to promote internationalization. They include study abroad experiences, increasing enrollment by international students, international studies or area studies programs, and also foreign language instruction. The role of foreign languages in university internationalization, however, has not always been clear. Many language studies scholars point out that foreign languages play an essential and necessary role in educating global citizens. These two quotes from Gelhart and Goodman, which are taken from the 2009 Modern Language Journal Perspectives column on internationalization and foreign languages, exemplify this perspective. Throughout the articles that make up the perspective section, the language-based nature of knowing and meaning is emphasized. And moreover, the columns recognize that in language, literature, and culture classrooms, the process of communication is the object of inquiry, which was also argued by Warner in 2011. In other words, students have the opportunity to consider how individuals position themselves through language and engage with social and political differences that get indexed in languages in foreign language studies classes. While on one hand, there is this belief that language departments will and should always lead and be present in conversations around internationalization, given their focus on languages, literatures, and cultures of various groups, a number of scholars point out that this isn't always the case. Warner, 2011, for example, points out a contradiction surrounding internationalization efforts. 
While there is an increased emphasis on developing the global and intercultural competencies of students, the perceived importance of foreign language departments is decreasing. Indeed, a number of universities have closed language programs or eliminated foreign language requirements during this time. Case in point, during a 2010 reformulation of general education requirements, George Washington University determined that introductory language classes did not meet the requirements to qualify as, and I quote, global perspectives, unquote, courses, in part because they were too focused on grammar, which does not involve critical thinking. Moreover, in a report published in 2006, Knight reported that the humanities fields, including foreign languages and cultural studies programs, were among the least internationalized disciplines. This contradiction has led Warner to comment that, quote, the role of language and literature departments in the project of internationalizing our higher education curricula seems at best murky and in the eyes of some marginal, end quote. As we reflected on our local curriculum, curriculum we were left asking ourselves, were our introductory and intermediate language courses really internationalized? Were students engaging with other foreign meanings? Or were they just coming into contact with them? Were we exposing students to various perspectives and helping them to discuss the different points of view adopted by speakers and writers? I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Sarah Mack now to continue and talk a little bit more about what we've done here at the University of Minnesota. So how can we address these issues and conflicts? Our approach centered on the internationalizing teaching and learning framework developed here at our home institution, the University of Minnesota. In this section, we'll provide an overview of how we approached internationalizing a fourth semester Spanish class, including an overview of the University of Minnesota framework and our redesigned course goals. Then we'll look at some examples of before and after, including materials, uh, sample materials from the redesign unit, and we'll share preliminary data and discuss challenges and recommendations for future work. The framework statement of global competence was our starting point. So the statement is, globally competent University of Minnesota faculty, staff, and students will demonstrate the skills, knowledge, and perspectives necessary to understand the world and work effectively to improve it. This is just 27 words, but if we read closely, we see important messages here that are essential to an internationalized university and class. First, the question of who is involved. Faculty, staff, and students, everyone. This isn't just about the faculty teaching the courses or staff who provide support or students or any other single or specific group. The idea is that everyone is involved. There's also a broad treatment of what some might call deliverables. Here we see not just skills, which is often interpreted as what you need to complete a task. What we see is that knowledge and perspectives are put on an equal footing with skills. Finally, there are the messages of active application of the skills, knowledge, knowledge and perspective. And there is a practical aspect of working effectively to improve the world, while we also see acknowledgement of the importance of understanding it as well. So it's a quite comprehensive definition given here in just 27 words, and this comprehensive approach to internationalization leads into the key concepts and questions that we engaged with as we undertook this work. Starting with um, our own definition that we, that we saw earlier uh, as ITL, or Internationalized Teaching and Learning, as an intentional approach to maximizing students' international, global, and intercultural learning. A key question for those engaged in applying this framework is to first define and understand what those things mean in our field or in, in your own discipline, in our case of SLA, in your college and in your department. Another key consideration for a model is that we place international, global and intercultural learning at the center of our course by making sure it is clearly articulated and well understood vis-a-vis -vis course goals. In our work, we've become aware that it is all too easy to consider international or global or intercultural learning as an assumed element in our second language courses. 
And what we've done is to keep coming back to our redesigned goals and objectives so every curricular decision we make is an intentional one that supports an internationalized approach. In other words, the framework is about intentionality and transparency. This kind of learning cannot be a byproduct. It happens when everyone understands it as a central goal of the course. Another key element of the framework is the idea of the individual instructor as a key driver of the process. And of course, as the instructor of the course, our own beliefs and values are important. So we try as much as possible to self-reflect on our own personal and cultural values and think about how they affect how we approach second language teaching and learning. And on a related note, to consider our own practices, that is, how we engage in our professional lives. Do our practices ref reflect the standards to which we hold our students in terms of all these things? And do we ourselves seek to understand different perspectives that challenge our own worldview? So these are some of the key considerations important to the process. And from there, we move on to considering course goals and objectives. We followed L.D. Fink's taxonomy of significant learning, which some of you may be familiar with. This model defines six different elements that interact with each other to result in significant learning. As you can see here, the six areas are foundational knowledge, application, integration, human dimension, caring, and learning how to learn. So this is the final uh, version of our redesign, redesign goals and objectives. There are 12 total, some in each of those categories, and we're going to pick out a few highlights. And these highlights show how the internationalized framework is woven throughout from foundational knowledge all the way through learning how to learn. For example, students will be aware of the Spanish-speaking world as varied and dynamic, identifying relevant issues, and also the diversity of perspectives that coexist with respect to these issues. By doing so, they will build awareness of how all communities are interconnected and begin to interpret and problematize aspects of their own and others' cultures. Finally, one of our goals is for students to continue exploring other communities. We want them to begin to formulate their own questions and their own ways to find answers. So those are a couple of specific examples from our redesigned course goals and objectives. So for us, the internationalizing approach has provided a way to organize our course, and we believe it would be possible to organize an entire program in the same way that is compatible with multiple interdisciplinary pedagogical models. In our case, we redesigned using the prin principles of the multi-literacies approach, as well as principles of a career readiness initiative that has been developed by our College of Liberal Arts. So in other words, at the course and programmatic level, we're using an internationalized teaching and learning framework as one element, element as a way to unite different approaches that we want to inform our language instruction. In this section, we'll share some examples from a unit on work and jobs that was re-envisioned to allow students to consider work and jobs and careers as culturally embedded products and practices. As many of us know, the topic of work, jobs, and careers is usually a unit or chapter in the begin in beginning and intermediate language curricula. Almost all beginning and intermediate textbooks have a chapter on this topic. As we considered this topic from the perspective of an internationalized framework, we intentionally focused on the cultural embeddedness of work and careers. The idea that how we conceptualize work, jobs, and our narratives around careers reflects cultural values. So this is a place where global competency or intercultural competency cannot be achieved by having students simply apply US-based perspectives through using the target language. We need to take it a step further. Let's take a look at our before. So this is a summary of the, the biggest changes before and after. Um, first of all, the, the, the chapter as it, it had existed for years included few authentic texts. There wasn't a lot of vocabulary support outside of lists of job titles, and both of those were, were very much based in the textbook that we were using. We also had a focus on students 
personal experiences and at times or mostly in unstructured ways and almost always with the U.S. student experience at the center. We had tangential ties between content, activities, and assessment following a very traditional communicative method approach. When we took a step back and redesigned using the internationalized approach, integrating, integrated with multi-literacies and career readiness, we ended up with a very different chapter. What we have now are authentic texts that draw on available designs and that provide contextualized, richer vocabulary. They also integrate perspectives from the Spanish-speaking world. We have more structured reflection on experiences, which is closely aligned with the College of Liberal Arts Career Readiness Initiative. We also have a class visit with a local Spanish-speaking job recruiter in which students do a question and answer session where they get to ask their own questions about the job world and, and do a little bit of their own investigating of different perspectives. And we have a newly created IPA-inspired assessment sequence that is co closely aligned with class content and activities, and students see a very clear tie between how they are assessed and what we're doing every day in class. To give you a, a sampling of the kinds of texts we are using, the first sample we'll look at is from uh, something that is from our Career Readiness Initiative. This is what we call the wheel, and it's a pretty simple, mostly graphic text that presents 10 different areas related to the world of jobs, work, and careers. Currently, we have this available in English, but also in uh, Spanish, French, and German, and I believe in Arabic and possibly Korean. Uh, so students use this as a starting point, and we use this to develop vocabulary and to structure things so that our learners can articulate their own experiences in more complex narratives. And we concentrate on a common intermediate grammar point as we do these activities, which is the use of the preterite and imperfect. So this is uh, one of the, the texts we use as a base, and as the chapter moves along, we examine texts from other universities. This example is from uh, the Instagram account of the University of San Andres in Argentina. And, this, and in this example, we have another text that has some pretty standard available designs in terms of how the, tech, the, the graphic is set up. And we use it as to continue to build our students' interpretive skills. So we start with basic comprehension, as always, but then we begin to unpack cultural embedded, culturally embedded values related to jobs, work, and careers. So we start asking questions like, whose perspective is this? Whose perspective is missing or not present? Who is the audience for this text? How does the author attract and keep the audience's attention? What cultural values related to our topic of work, careers, and jobs are visible or present or promoted or challenged in this text? And throughout, we keep coming back to the idea that as we examine and explore these things, we want to seek to understand how linguistic features convey these messages, or how do those features work together to convey these messages. And then we also take on this step to become aware of our own US hegemonic views and make a little bit of that transition from focusing on the personal discourse to the global discourse and talk about how do these messages confirm or challenge our own perspectives. We've been able to gather uh, some data so far on um, the student experience and um, Perhaps unsurprisingly, students self-report that they do gain more awareness of global perspectives with the redesigned content. Um, that's what we would expect, uh, given the fact that we are now intentionally um, including texts that present global perspectives. We're intentionally um, asking questions that really get at that. One thing that we have seen is that um, we, there is a need for repeated statements linking the course goals and internationalizing, especially in the online course activities. So some of the homework activities we do need to be more strongly linked to what we're doing in class. Um, and then another finding so far, um, it was that what students felt was helpful in this chapter in terms of global, intercultural, and international learning varied widely. So the takeaway from that is that we need to keep providing a variety of, of activities. In terms of challenges and recommendations, 
Um, of course, one challenge and also a, a clear recommendation is, is related to the idea of how you communicate course goals and objectives. Right? They should be accessible, clear, and transparent, and they should always situate the internationalized curriculum as the organizing principle. On a related note, uh, the language on the syllabus and in online course materials and activities should integrate that, the same kind of language as well. Um, some challenges that are uh, related specifically to multi-section, multi-instructor context include providing instructor training and support, especially for the day-to-day -day internationalized practice. Most of the instructors teaching this class including me, um, we, we're not trained in a, 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 a language pedagogy that makes the, uh, the, for a real seamless integration of the principles of an internationalized curricula, curriculum. So there's a real need to uh, provide training and ongoing support for that. And also, um, the idea of mapping competencies, the goals and objectives, the assessment and learning activities, so everyone can see how everything works together and you can have consistency across the section, sections in that way. To conclude, um, as a discipline, foreign languages enjoy a strong disciplinary tradition and occupy a logical position to lead the way in internationalizing the curriculum. However, this involves not just traditional language development to negotiate meaning in technologized and rationalized discourse, but also the ability to navigate complex social, academic, and professional spaces where the local and the global contrast, contradict, or even clash. In order to do this, we have to intentionally design courses and provide programs of study that embrace a complex, non-hegemonic, less US-centered interpretation of global competency. So we invite you to reflect on your practice and consider whether international perspectives are central to your goals, instruction, and assessment, and if not, take action to move in that direction. We ourselves continue to reflect and act to improve student learning in our courses, and there's still much work to be done. Before we end our video, we'd like to acknowledge that this work was the result of many different people. So we'd like to thank especially uh, individuals who are part of the University of Minnesota ITL 2016-17 cohort leadership and staff, the Global Programs and Strategy Alliance, Center for Educational Innovation, International Student and Scholar Services, Academic Tech and Support Services, and the Center for Academic Research on Language Acquisition, usually known as CARLA. We'd also like to thank the University of Minnesota College of Liberal Arts Career Readiness Initiative. Lastly, we'd like to share that if you're interested in a trip to wintertime Minnesota, the 2020 conference will be held at the end of February. Thank you again.